Okay, hey everybody, welcome to another episode of On the Wrist from Off the Cuff. Today's uh, topic I feel like has been one that's been a long time coming. And it's a segment that I've been planning for a really long time uh, because my channel does feature um, quite a few different micro brands, and, and many of them are in the upper tiers. Of course, I do enjoy my affordable watches, don't get me wrong. I enjoy $150, um, you know, Orient Mako as much as the next guy. Um, and of course, I have a whole slew of Seikos. I mean, if you guys pay any attention to my Instagram, you'll find that those are some of my most worn watches. But also some of my most worn watches are from this tier of, of watch, uh, which I feel is, is kind of that premium micro brand uh, air. So there are very few brands that are brave enough to kind of venture out into this territory. And, um, you know, for very good reason there is a huge problem with this particular market and really i'd say the biggest problem with the luxury or high-end micro brand market is uh is that people don't understand that market even the consumers are very confused by this market they're not sure really what they should be getting for that money or where their money is going you know, um, be because for all intents and purposes, little micro brands, they're really known for cutting out the middleman and saving you a ton of money and giving you a bunch of very feature rich timepieces. So many brands do that. Um, you know, there's tons that are out there in that, uh, you know, 800 and below range. And they may have a special edition here and there or a special movement that comes in or a COSC model um, that'll venture above $1,000 US. And um, there are some brands that just go ahead and start out at that level. And they say, hey, here's our entry level watch and it costs over a thousand bucks. And I think that's where a lot of the lines get crossed because when somebody's searching for a micro brand, um, I think you kind of are indoctrined by a lot of homage watches, you know, the Steinharts, even some of the earlier Christopher Wards, but I think Christopher Wards really established itself now as more of an independent or a boutique brand. And then you have other brands that have been around for a while, but, you know, still have that sell direct kind of mindset like Zen. Um, so, you know, you're not really going to find those in too many boutiques. So you, you kind of have this brand confusion because you have watches that have been around for a while brands that have been around for a while that are independent um that that kind of have a little bit of horological uh, lineage to them and then you have the brand new upstarts and you know you have everything from um a 400 dollars mecha quartz watch um all the way up to an 800 dollars diver that's you know a thousand meters water resistant right so you kind of have those two spaces, one on each end, one that's, hey, you've been around, you're very established. The other that's, hey, I'm very much entry level. I'm going to give you as many, I'm just going to pack in as much punch as I can, right? So like the the beauty of like maybe uh, one of my Zins, the uh, five, five, sixes are, is that you get the street cred, right? Well enough. I mean, I'd say it's comparable to something like an Oris. Um, Except uh, you can buy the actual retail prices and, and they're still pretty decent, right? Like, that's pretty cool. Or then maybe you buy something like a Helsin um, or Notice Watch. And those watches are great too. Um, and they could be in the four to six to $800 range. And they're magnificent watches and they pack a ton of uh, bang per buck. And, and those are really great. But then you kind of have what's in between, which is, you know, you have these also newer brands um, that are really setting out to make something that's a little bit more luxurious or a little bit more high end. And I think the, the, the thing is, is when somebody thinks of high end, right, the archetype would be Rolex. So Rolex watches are, of course, you know, they're, they're very much known for high end. But in your head, you're telling yourself that all the money from that Rolex is going to marketing and uh, it's going to the team and it's paying for all these huge machines 
um, you know, uh, that they're using to do everything in house. And if a micro brand doesn't market itself, right, at least not the same way that a large brand does with brand ambassadors and, and all that, if your money's not going into the marketing and it's not going into the machining and tooling because a lot of these micro brands are outsourcing, of course, um, you know, the, the cases and the dials and, you know, they're, they're more uh, watch designers, uh, you know, um, and some are definitely more tied to watchmaking than others, but it's, and I, don't, I wouldn't think it's a knock against a watch that's, to, uh, you know, 2,500 bucks if it's something where a guy just really understands engineering and craftsmanship and they know what looks good and they want to put out a timepiece and maybe they aren't, you know, um, a, uh, a classically trained watchmaker. I mean, I wouldn't fault that against any brand. Um, but so I think with that kind of misstep, right, we're like, OK, well, if we're going to buy something that's in the luxury range, where's that money going? Um, it goes to all these other frivolous things. So if I'm going to pay twenty five hundred bucks for a watch, you know, um, why? Why should I pay that much? Right. Like, why does Pelton or Monto or Brellum or Seahome? Why do these brands? Why do they have to charge so much? Right. And I think it's one of the things that for me, it's, it's a little bit easier to understand because I, I, I know manufacturing, right? In my day job, I, <laughs> I deal with manufacturing and, um, you know, I work for a manufacturer. Uh, they, they make things, they produce things, right? And the smaller batches you produce, the more expensive things are. The larger batches, the cheaper. So, I mean, it's just, it's simple math, right? It's, if you're only going to produce 200 or 50 or, you know, it's not like when Seiko produces 2,500 of something. I mean, they have limited editions that are 5,000, 7,000 issues, right? And a lot of these watches here are, you know, probably haven't made it to 1,000 units yet. Um, so, and that's after being released and going through multiple runs and, and iterations and updates. So... You know, that's one of the things. That's that's where your money goes. It, it goes into supporting somebody with a dream and a focus and um, and somebody who's going to bring you something that's not out there on the market yet. And so that's why I really wanted to bring out these particular watches to take a look at um, and because I think they really kind of do address that high-end luxury segment. Um, but they're, of course, from uh, what we would many would consider micro brands. And um, so, you know, I would say, um, yeah, I feel like this is a conversation that gets started and argued about in so many YouTube videos in the comment section. So I thought, why not? make a video addressing it. I'd love to hear some of your guys' points on what your thoughts are, you know, kind of where you value, where your money goes, because there's, I think everything here represents a different part of kind of that market. I mean, you have something like the Pelton, right? The uh, Perseus here, which is an absolutely outstanding timepiece. Um, and it does have a top grade movement, you know, fully decorated, but this is a completely hand uh, finished, piece by one guy by the by the passionate owner of the company um this is all machined here in the united states because he actually has paid the overhead of having uh to buy all these cnc machines because uh it, during his day job he you know he makes microphones uh, that are also made in the u.s uh so there's there's a certain level of understanding of craftsmanship and the whole made in the USA and and you know you're supporting somebody I mean look at the deep edges I mean this is super and then I'd say one of the things about this that really makes it very much in the luxury range is that it doesn't compromise it has an aesthetic that it's going for and it doesn't care if you know if you're if you're not a fan of deep brushing or high polish or you know tons of tiny little screws that are gonna have to go together to make this but i mean if you look at the tolerances here look at that that's not really that's not sagging that thing can pretty much stand straight up i mean it's pretty nuts um so there's a certain level of just passion 
there that, that this watch represents, uh, you know, and that the guy who made it is, was like, yeah, you know what I would love? I'd love this watch. And I've been in that situation. There's watches that I have created in my mind that I would just love for somebody to produce, but they're not out there, right? And I don't have the capital to invest. But hey, maybe in the future, I, I would love to definitely, um, at, the, at the very least, start off with maybe a little collaboration um, with any of the brands. So if you're a micro brand out there and uh, you you think I have a nice style and a good eye, let me know because I am definitely uh, would love to embark on that journey but something like this right you you're you're paying for the craftsmanship the artisan uh side of it i mean there's this thing right here represents more of craftsmanship and um you know it's kind of that single batch mindset uh, this is really made to order so that mindset is something that is just you know personified through a, a timepiece like this so i think that's pretty incredible uh because there's going to be definitely watches that cost a lot more that are going to be very much uh you know uh, I, I guess you could say that have more of a machine's touch involved that that aren't as involved um when it comes to actually producing the watch, uh, where there's a lot less hand finishing. And then you have stuff like, let's say this Seaholm here, which I think is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and the, where the money goes in to something like this is is really, it's it's in the specs. Uh, this thing is, is a monster. It has, uh, it's just completely overbuilt and over-engineered. Anti-magnetic, anti-shock, 200 meters water resistance. Um, you unscrew this crown. It's just absolutely bulletproof. This thing is bulletproof. And yeah, sure, the aesthetic might not be for everyone. It might be a little bit graphic, a little bit bold, but I think they really nail it. I mean, and every part that you touch on this watch feels absolutely outstanding. Sure, it doesn't have a lot of the fancy finishing or, you know, they're not trying to do that. This is a tool watch. They built this thing to be a tank and to, to be able to be on the wrist of a pilot or an engineer or somebody that's, it doesn't really matter where you're working and what industry this thing can go anywhere and really do anything for you. So I can appreciate that. I think that's absolutely outstanding. And then, uh, you know, even here in their, uh, in their diver model, look at that. I mean, that, this this bezel action isn't meant to be sexy, but this thing is just pure function. It's just absolutely outstanding. So you get stuff like that, or you know, let's say the Monta. Um, this is one of my favorite watches, if not my favorite watch in my collection. Um, and this thing gets so much wrist time. It's absolutely gorgeous, and this really. You know, again, the, the, this keys in on the on the craftsmanship. Sure, it's not going to be as much of a hand finished piece as the Pelton, but this thing is just luxurious. It's butter, everything, all those touch points. It just oozes luxury. Everything about it, the finish, the bevels. You know, the engineering that went into this, the the design. And you got, of course, a very nice movement, nice and slim. So you're getting that engineering side. Look at that case profile, just gorgeous. The dial um, with the little touch of red text. I mean, this thing's gorgeous. And then it's, you know, it, of course, it does have a lot of timing involved. Um, There's in-house regulation. So it keeps great time. And then you kind of have the evolution of that. And you have this gorgeous Ocean King, you know, version 2. You have the ratcheting clasp and all the goodies there, as you can see. Um which is absolutely outstanding. It, again, it continues on with these bevels. You know, it's going the extra mile. That's that's luxury, right? You don't need that. You don't need a freaking gorgeous bevel right there, but damn, is it nice to have it, right? So that's one of the things, that's where it really crosses into that. This has all of the bells and whistles. Think about it. I mean, ceramic insert, fully loom BGW-9, uh, re in-house regulated movement, so you know it's keeping outstanding timing. Um, BG, uh, I mean, just everything. Uh, solid end links. The end links actually wear wonderful because uh, the, it doesn't push out the ends of those lugs so it can wrap around even a smaller wrist. Then these are all individually articul articulated, beveled, just gorgeous. I mean, and then it has this completely, again, another over-engineered piece is this outstanding 60-click bezel. And it's a 60-click bezel that really just, 
it kicks ass. This thing is nuts. It's a 60 click bezel that is more secure than many 120 click bezels. That's how precise um, and how well engineered and how well executed this piece is. And then you, and then yeah, not to mention from far away, even it just catches the light. It's a gorgeous piece. It has, I mean, think about it. These, these are all the things people ask for an original design, fantastic finishing, thin profile. I mean, it has the date at six. People are go, they go nuts. If I, if I have to have a date, at least make it at six, right? Let it be an original design and not an homage. Um, you know, let it have all these, this is, this is it. This is exactly what everyone complains about when they get another sub homage. Why couldn't they apply these skills, these talents, this engineering, this level of customization? Why couldn't they allow, you know, apply that to an original design? And here you have it. I mean, this thing is gorgeous. And uh, rightfully so, I hope this thing is selling well because, uh, you know, in this market, you have to support people that are doing what you ask. And this is exactly what people have been asking for. And, you know, Monta, I think, is a great brand to think about as far as do they listen to their customers? They do. They absolutely do. The first iteration of the Ocean King came out. And guess what? It had this crazy Eterna movement that was, you know, maybe a little overly expensive, a little overly thick, a little overly complicated, right? Um, and then they moved over to a much thinner and and still outstanding movement um that is ultimately more serviceable that's going to give you more longevity um you know easier really just the kind of that use case and, and in actuality i mean it's probably the worst thing you want to do is get in-house movement from a young brand <laughs> if anything you want to get you know those tried and true movements it's i think it's great for brand strength for them to have in-house movements you know, it's just like the Oris, right? I, I mean, Oris, may, they made an in-house movement. More power to them. Damasco, they, you know, they came out with an in-house movement. It's great, but you know what? The models they sell have very, very standard movements inside of there and not even in the range of something like an SW300, you know, or 2892. They have things that are more along the lines of just a 2824, right? Um, quote, unquote, workhorse. Um, so I think that's just outstanding, right, for what it offers. And then you have something like the Brellum Duo Box. And I mean, this right here to me represents um, just the whole lineage and the idea of watchmaking. This is a watchmaker's watch. Literally, a, a watchmaker, you know, uh, he decided to, he's, you know, just a long lineage of... Uh, in a long line of Swiss watchmakers, and and don't get me wrong, the Swiss weren't always on top of the uh, horological pile. But what the Swiss did is they they were the first ones to really key in on that reliability, um, even before the Japanese did, and that's how the Swiss kind of over toppled uh, British timepieces and um, and French timepieces with their complicated in-house movements and whatnot. Um, that's really where the Swiss and Rolex, of course. Um, you know, that, that's where they built their reputation, not only being able to have something that was fantastic, but something that was usable, something that was a tool. And then you have something like this, COSC, right? Where'd your money go? Okay, well, it got COSC certified. It has gorgeous finishing that you just, you can't argue with. Everything on this is just pure magic. It's got not only uh, one, but two box dome sapphires. Um, and this thing is just outstanding. And then you got this top grade movement, which is not only top grade. I mean, this thing is just top class, top of the class. Look at every, any way you can finish it. I mean, this thing has like a perlage <laughs> even there. That's a quick release strap. I mean, it has every single bell and whistle. Is it cheap? No, you know? But it just represents something so special in the market that, you know, I, I just have to give them credit for. Um, so then you also have, you know, uh, you know, the next evolution of Brellum. Of course, they've done a ton of these. But the next evolution is going to be something like this right here. The Wavern. They came out with a more dressy watch but also still in that kind of everyday tone and man look at the finishing on this 
just absolutely blown away by this piece. And and the proportions are amazing. I want people to understand the proportions on this watch are just about perfect. The scale might not be for everybody, right? So there's a difference between proportion and scale. This might be a little bit too big for some people, but you know what? Do not let that scare you off because this thing is just excellent. I mean, you're talking millimeters, guys. Millimeters. There are people that are fight and die over a millimeter, and that's just one millimeter instruction. The difference between a 40 and a 42, right? Or a 38 and a 40 millimeter. There's so much more to how a watch wears. Um, and I haven't even done a full review for this watch. Um, definitely keep an eye out on the channel because this thing is just gorgeous, and I'm extremely impressed with what Brellum continues to do. And then they're also listening to their fan base. Look, there's a lot less script on this dial, is there not? <laughs> People's kind of one gripe about the old dual box there was it had a, a lot of text. Um, here it's definitely been, there's reduced quite a bit and this thing is just balanced. Look at everything on it, gorgeous. Again, and then of course, these straps are interchangeable. Same thing with Monta. Their straps are also interchangeable, which is amazing, right? Um, and then these Seahome watches, straps interchangeable. So they, they think about these things. And the nice thing is that it actually pays off to you for these brands to actually kind of be smart and save a bit of money, right? Unlike, uh, let's say, a brand like Seiko, which a lot of their straps and bracelets are completely throwaway pieces. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, there's stuff in the higher end that's amazing. Um, and then there's also stuff that's in the five $600 range that it, you would just, the QC issues that slip through, you, it's, it's pretty upsetting, to be honest. So, I mean, these timepieces right here just represent something so special in the market. And I just hope to keep seeing more people, um, you know, do what people are asking for. Because, you know, as you're on your kind of journey, there's only so many G-Shocks you can wear or care about. And, and, and you know, I spent a lot of the time in active duty Marine Corps. Um, so, yeah, there's... <laughs> Uh, there's a limit to the amount of cheap watches that I could enjoy Timex's and G-Shocks. Um, eventually got to the point where, um, you know, you just want something better. You want to treat yourself. You want to feel like you're spending your money and it's in something you can pass down. And don't get me wrong, you can pass down an SKX. You can pass down an Orient Mako. You can pass down, of course, tons of Presage watches. Those are very cool watches too. But what I think these watches deliver on um, a little bit more of is just the fact of how special they are. Um, you know, let's face it, there's been times as as niche, you know, and as crazy as uh, something like the Seiko Alpinist is, I've seen them on people's wrists. <laughs> the Sarb, those are Japanese, those are JDM only Seikos. They're so popular that I've seen them on other people's wrists and not at watch meets, right? Stuff like this, you just have to be an enthusiast because you won't stroll past this at a boutique. Um, this is something you're gonna look online, lust after, you're gonna do your research, you're gonna tell yourself 10 reasons why you shouldn't get it until you figure out 12 reasons why you should. And um, you know, for the people that are along in that ride that are willing to pay 15, 1600, 2500 bucks for a timepiece, I say that these are some awesome options for you and just this whole genre in general. There are there's channels out there that will say these are absolute shitters. These is a shitter range, you know. Why say just save your money and get a used Seamaster? Like really? A used Seamaster? Like that's not even old enough to feel like a classic yet. Like you're not even getting a story out of it. You're just getting a dated watch. Like that's Blow, it blows my mind how that is like the go-to advice for somebody that's like, I want to. I have two thousand bucks on a watch. I want something that's gonna do everything that I need it to. What should I buy? And people are like, buy a used Seamaster. It just blows my mind. Um, you know <laughs> that that that's people's answer is that buy a watch that looks like it's from the '90s, that feels like it's from the '90s, and it is from the '90s. Um, I mean. <laughs> And that's, maybe that's just me because it is a very popular idea. But to me, I'd much rather have any one of these watches. Um, they're just something that's 
just special about them. I mean, let me know what you guys think. Let me hear your argument. Let me, why are these shit? Why are these not worth your dime? And at the same time, why have you taken a look and maybe you wear them and you have a great story? You know, maybe you're a dad, maybe you're a grad um, and, and you got these, you know, gifted to you. Um, or maybe this was your, you know, low key I made it watch because um, if you look at the exchange and the, you know, how much money's worth, Back in the day, making it and buying a Rolex Submariner made sense for most people's paychecks because Rolex subs didn't cost 8K. Um, so um, these are the kind of watch you could treat yourself after saving up for, you know, just a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. And then it's you buy it and it gives you so much in return. So I just think that this is a really kind of special place in the market. And I think these pieces really personify that. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I think this will probably be my first video of the new year of 2019. And I wanted to go into 2019, you know, swinging and, and just let you guys know um, that I love this kind of space. Um, you know, and there's other brands that are out there that I haven't got to quite dive into yet. There's the Oak and Oscars, um, you know, of the world and whatnot. And there's, there's just so many different brands that are out there now that are coming out with watches that are outstanding that cost more than a thousand bucks uh but you know when you are getting what you pay for i don't think there's really any argument you know how can you say it's not worth it if they're doing everything that you need them to do um and if it's worth it to you and you pay for it then it's clearly worth it right because you paid so with that said, I don't ramble on forever. You know that I could, you know that I have, you know that I will again, guys. But let's go ahead and cut this one off. If you liked the video, please do hit like. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe for more content just like this. Even hit that bell notification so you don't miss out, guys. Um, also, let me know what you think in the comments below. Um, you know, am I crazy? Was this nuts? Do you so upset that I talked for five minutes before I even touched a watch? Let me know. Thanks, guys. Bye.